please welcome to the stage from Iron Circus Comics, C. Spike Trotman. Okay. So you've heard about like million dollar podcasts and like million follower mommy bloggers. Um, it's time to think small. Just gonna bring the bar back down here. Uh, the thing I have in common with a lot of people who are at this venue and speaking today is uh, I never thought I'd be where I am. Like when I was 21, graduated college, got sort of thrust out into the world and uh, I just wanted to make comics and I had no idea how I was gonna make that work. Comics were in a really weird place at the time, which I'll get into. And uh, all I knew is <laughs> if I tried hard enough, maybe something would happen. And this is kind of what this talk is gonna be about. It's gonna be about, you know, I don't know what I'm doing, like a lot of people <laughs> will say when they're asked about how they got where they are. And all I know is I had a ton of reinforcement from outside folks that told me, you know, you know what, you are exactly right. You have no fucking clue. <laughs> <laughs> and it's called That Will Never Work because that has been a sort of constant dull roar in the background of my entire professional life. Okay, just because I know no one cares about comics, I've kind of put together the, bullet, the highlight reel, if you will about me. Um, see Spike Trotman, what's up? That is a self-portrait. <laughs> I think it's a stunning likeness, personally. And, uh, you know, Spike is fine. The C is just, no one calls me that. <laughs> uh, professional cartoonist. I started cartooning primarily on the internet. Um, I've been making comics all through high school, all through middle school, whatever. You know, it's, it's, it's a passion thing. And, uh, the high school comics were terrible, and the middle school comics were terrible, and the early 20s comics were terrible. But what mattered is I made them. And uh, I made them for my friends, I made them for myself, and they were supposed to be the entire point of my life. Like, I was telling my parents just to keep the peace, you know, I'm gonna be a doctor, don't worry about it. <laughs> because where I come from, you have two kids, and one's a doctor, and one's a lawyer and then you go down to like the country club or you go to the AMA conference, the American Medical Association conference in the summer and people ask you how your kids are doing and they go, good, so-and-so's in law school and so-and-so's on the pre-med track down at Ivy League U. And everyone goes, oh, and then you have drinks. And that was supposed to be the plan. <laughs> that was supposed to be the plan and I, I just fucked it all up, I fucked it all up. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, I happened to be ejected into comics in a really transitional, let's go with that, transitional time, where in the 90s, early 2000s, comics was on the back foot. It was sort of in a defensive mode. Marvel Comics, they weren't Marvel Entertainment back then. Marvel Comics had declared bankruptcy at one point. A lot of comic shops and a lot of distributors were still recovering from what we call the black and white boom and bust. And while the 90s were sort of the, the high water mark for comic book sales in a lot of ways, there was, you know, that when the Piper was paid, a lot of shops went out of business. The distributors, all but one distributor, eventually collapsed. So now there was an effective monopoly. That distributor sort of decided that there wasn't enough money in alternative comics. And, for all intents and purposes, alternative means any comic that doesn't star a man in spandex with hyper-realistic rendered muscles. <laughs> so that was being sort of worked out of the market. There was a time you could go into a comic shop and you could buy all kinds of stuff, but the distributor decided that carrying this level of variety was very tiring. So they set a minimum order that most independent floppy comics could never meet. So almost over the course of like a couple of months, the independent floppy, the non-superhero comic floppy disappeared from stores. And it's kind of like, I compare it, this is very self-important, but I compare it to what's kind of going on in Greece with austerity measures, where the economy shrinks because there's less money. 
and less people are employed and no one's hiring, so they don't have money to spend, so the economy shrinks again, and that makes it worse, so less people have jobs and the economy shrinks again. That's kind of what was going on in comics, and most people never had any idea that, you know, I'll make a living at this, I'll support a family on this. That was not even on the horizon. They did it because they loved it. And that is the world I was ejected into. However, there was an option, and it was this newfangled thing. And it was called web comics. <laughs> and the idea was you make a comic and you put it on the internet. And you wouldn't have to worry about a distributor going, um, we can't sell this. And you wouldn't have to worry about an editor going, um, no one will buy this. You could just get a, get a domain and put your comic online. And um, that was cool because the, the bar from entry went from, from here down to here. And as a result, there was sort of this bleh of comics. And, <laughs> A lot of variety and a lot of interest and a lot of really cool things started popping up online. And uh, traditional cartoonists and publishers really fucking hated that. They hated it. And primarily because they saw us as line jumpers and they saw us as unworthy. They saw us as people who were above our station and not interested in putting out good product or putting out good stories, drawing well, writing well, any of that. Um, we were branded dilettantes, people who were ushering the death of newspapers and comic books, you know, towards the ultimate oblivion of publishing because, well, if people can just read comics for free, they'll never come into the comic shop. They'll never pick up a newspaper. Like the only reason people picked up newspapers was to read the comic section. Like maybe in the 20s, not now. <laughs> so <laughs> it's weird because it was almost, it felt kind of like trench warfare. Everybody was like, web comics were over here and they're like, and <laughs> publishing, like traditional publishing was over here and they're like, and never the twain shall meet, you know? And that's the world I was in. And you know, you had to choose a side, which I did. And I was in web comics. And part of the reason that appealed to me, I'll get into. It's primarily because uh, what I wanted to make had nothing to do with what was being sold. And then Kickstarter came along. After my years of trench warfare and the web comics, comics battle, Kickstarter showed up. And uh, I looked at it and I went, this is gonna be amazing. This is, how, who could not see the potential in this model where I know my stuff is worthy and my readers know it's worthy, but believe it or not, drawing funny doodles on the internet makes it pretty tough to get like $6,000 together to get a print run together. And I just, I was so blown away. And the year it launched, I launched my first project is for a book called Poor Craft, because when you're a cartoonist, you know a lot about being poor. And it, it was basically, hey, you know, don't have much money? Well, this is the best way to find a roommate. Here's what you do when you gotta get drunk on Saturday, but you don't wanna pay for it. Oh, here's an idea. Are you tired of eating bread and peanut butter? Go to the art district on Saturday night. There's probably gonna be some kind of opening and they're gonna have stuffed mushrooms and shrimp and all kinds of good shit. And you can just stand there eating hors d'oeuvres. Like, what do you think of this piece? Oh, it's oh, amazing, amazing. Let me just, yeah, oh. And you know, that was my life. So I just sat there and wrote down my life and made a comic out of it. And I, I hired an artist to do the, uh, the interior work. And I went on Kickstarter and I was like, hi guys. Uh, wow, Kickstarter, weird, huh? Okay, I need $6,000 to pay this artist. And I ended up getting $13,000, which believe it or not, was a big deal in 2009. <laughs> and I would find forum posts about me talking about anyone who can raise $13,000 on Kickstarter has no business using Kickstarter. That's entirely too much. <laughs> Anyone who, can, who is pulling 13 k just by asking for it, they need to go to a publisher and leave Kickstarter to people who really need it. Perennial part of my experience, just long, tired discussions of who really needs Kickstarter? Guess what? It's never me. No matter what, apparently I never need it. Everyone else, yo, me, no, no. But on the back of all of this, like with all this going on where I'm figuring out Kickstarter, I'm trying to build a career, 
I founded something called Iron Circus Comics. And quite frankly, it's called Iron Circus. I get questions a lot. I already own the domain. <laughs> I had no money. <laughs> and I was trying to think of a publishing game, and I was, I was that kid in school. If you really dig hard enough, you can probably find my old college ruled notebooks. And in the margins, it's like, oh, this is what I'm going to name my comic books company. And at the time, I owned a little doxy dog, because, you know, when I was a teenager, and I was like, oh, I'm going to go with Invincible Dachshund. That's going to be the name of my, my comics company, because my dog is rad. And uh, then I became an adult, and I was like, <laughs> maybe not, maybe not. But I founded Iron Circus, and originally, it was just publishing me. And then I kind of got this brainwave where I'm like, you know, I have this infrastructure, I have the know-how, I have friends that like Kickstarter, but are super intimidated by it. So they're, they're like, oh, I, I, wish I, could, I wish I could use something like that without all the administrative stuff behind the scenes. And I thought to myself, I can, I can use Iron Circus to publish people like that. I got the warehouse space, I, I got the know-how, I've got everything set up, I know the bumps that you run into. And so I began publishing other people. But that is the long form of what's going on with me. If you look me up online, chances are this is the first thing you see. <laughs> this is kind of what has carried me over the hump, basically. This is what has financed Iron Circus. And what this is, as it says, is an erotic anthology made by women and published biannually, which is a terrible word because it's like twice a year or every two years. In this case, <laughs> It's every two years, and uh, made up a character to go on the cover. There's the smut peddler mascot. Uh, her name is Dynamite, by the way. <laughs> and um, the cover for 2012 was illustrated by a cartoonist named Emily Carroll, who is incredible. And as is the case with a lot of people I work with, <laughs> it was a definite just sort of like Hail Mary random kind of thing. Where I'm like, I'm going to send her an email. She won't answer. She'll say no, whatever. She got back to me. She was like, I'm like, oh, all right, cool. And on the, on the 2014 cover is Gemma Salome, and uh, online she's Ox Boxer, which I always thought was really great. Where she can't get Ox Boxer, she goes by Bison Fisticuffs. <laughs> <laughs> which is like simultaneously weird, but also it's like, who goes to a site and puts an Ox Boxer and goes, oh, it's taken? <laughs> But yeah, um, the 2014 cover is by her, and it's amazing. And if you look very carefully, you can see me on it. And I'm the one going, ah. <laughs> and these were both on Kickstarter. And the premise was, OK, I like porn. And my experience with porn has been 90% of it is 1,000% not made with me in mind. I like drawings of naked people. I like drawings of naked people going at each other. What I don't like is most drawings of naked people going at each other, <laughs> I find on the internet. And yeah, thing about comics, there are fucking tons of porn comics. Tons. <laughs> but none of them appealed to me. And it was kind of like the two, the two, like point A and point B needed to connect in the middle somewhere. It was like, I like porn. I don't like any porn being made. Oh, I should make some porn. <laughs> so in 2012, <laughs> yeah. In 2012, I wrote some friends and acquaintances, and I basically said, hey, you guys want to make some porn with me? And it was almost as if they had been waiting their whole lives for someone to write them <laughs> and ask them that. It's like, I send out the email two minutes later, it's like, oh, do I want to make porn? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes. And I organized it, I paid for it out of pocket, I had about $300 to my name after everything was paid for for Smut Peddler 2012. And I stuck it on Kickstarter and it did well and word got out and two years later, did the same thing. It did really well too. And these are the basic premises of Smut Peddler, just, just for the record. To be in Smut Peddler, your comic needs to stress consent and mutual willingness to actually be there and be fucking. And you think, well, that's a low bar. Oh, I wish it was. <laughs> I wish it was. And while I am not into body shaming on any level, the sort of like 
porn cyborgs, the Olympians expertly crafted to fuck on camera that we see in most porn, they tend to be kind of monotone and one size fits all. And that's fine for people who are into that, but I kind of wanted to see more bodies, and I wanted to see more bodies being shown as sexy and desirable, because we all know we kind of, I know, right? <laughs> and just as an example, um, Smut Peller 2012, it opens with a story about, uh, I am mopey goth guy, and I'm at the house party, and it's lame because I'm mopey goth guy. My face is pierced, what's up? And at the party with him is a guy on crutches, the kind that, you know, they, they go up here on the arms, and he's just sort of standing against a wall, and he's been injured in some way that the story doesn't go into. And they go upstairs, and, and I've, had, I've had people flipping through the book at cons and buy it on the strength of that story, because it's like, oh my god, this is like a disabled person being depicted as sexy and desirable. I have literally never seen that in my life. How much do you want for it? And that experience is sort of what, what tells me what I'm doing is like the right thing. This is, this is something people have been hungry for. And again, I think I've mentioned this, but if in case I haven't, to be in Smut Peddler, you need to have a woman involved in the story. A woman has to be on the creative side. They need to be the writer or the artist or the colorist or whatever. That's just a rule. <laughs> with probably the most blowback ever. Although I have gotten some super creepy emails arguing the consent thing. Um, <laughs> having a woman on the team, quite frankly, it stops a lot of bullshit right at the door. <laughs> because quite frankly, there's a lot of dudes out there that think they can write porn. And <laughs> oh, it's not my job to disabuse you of your delusions, but <laughs> not on my time, Skippy, and not on my dime. So those are the rules, boom, 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 they went up. And along with the people I invited, there were some open call things, that's kind of my move. I invite some people for half the book, and half the book, new cartoonists I've never heard of send me proposals. I get around 300, 350, 400 for Smut Peddler, and out of those maybe, I don't know, 10 make it. So it's, it's kind of a high demand kind of thing. And while I was running these projects, something came up again that I mentioned kind of dogs my entire career. And it was, it sort of went from the occasional voice in the background to sort of that celestial choir that was the dull roar. And I kind of tried to sort of condense the general tone of what I hear in the, in the gray text in the background. But I'm gonna point out one especially that has stuck with me over the years, which is particularly interesting, interesting to me because it was said to a close friend. And it was said by an established professional who should be fucking grateful right now that I am about a thousand times more decent than he will ever be because I'm not naming names. <laughs> My friend was told by this person, don't hang out with Spike and don't listen to anything Spike says because she doesn't have the background or the education to make it in comics. Little about me, real quick. Um, my father went to college at 15. He is a doctor. And for the hell of it, in his 40s, he got an MBA and started a medical group. Um, I grew up in Potomac, Maryland, which kind of goes back and forth between something like fourth richest and ninth richest suburb in the United States. King Hussein of Jordan was my neighbor. <laughs> Dikembe Mutombo, the basketball player, was my neighbor. Um, Patrick Ewing had a house there, although he never lived in it, so whatever. I don't judge, his house, whatever. Uh, Sugar Ray Leonard was my neighbor. I grew up maybe a three mile drive from the owner of the Washington football team. And the college I ended up going to was a historically black college. If you are familiar with the TV show, A Different World, that's where I went. I went to Spelman College, which is Hillman College, a $40,000 a year historically black university that was founded back when rich black people in the South could not send their children to Harvard. And it's across the street from Morehouse College, 
which is where Martin Luther King and Samuel L. Jackson went. I mentioned the Samuel L. Jackson because Pulp Fiction was real big when I was in college. So, and, yeah, Martin Luther King, but did you know? <laughs> and um, I went there with no scholarship. My dad paid full price all four years. And um, I have a postgraduate degree. So it took me a minute to sort of think about this. Like, I don't have the background or the education to make it in comics, because quite frankly, when you get down to brass tacks, I have a better background in education than the majority of people on planet Earth. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was sitting there and I was trying to like, you know, tease this apart. Like, what could this mean? Like, oh, does it have the background? Oh. Got it. And that one kind of stuck with me, needless to say, because I know it's out there. I know there are people out there who see me and instantly assume things, but it's actually rare that someone puts a voice to it without being anonymous, if you understand what I mean. And the fact, like, the absolute social indecency of like not putting this on a message board somewhere under an assumed name, not randomly saying it on like a podcast somewhere while omitting my name, but telling a close friend was sort of their way of saying, I don't fucking care. Nothing you do will ever matter. Nothing you do will ever come close to what I've achieved. Nothing you do is important. I don't even have to worry about that day that you lap me on the comics career track, because that will never happen. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> These are only two of the seven Kickstarters I've run to date. Um, the first one in 2012 pulled about 83,000 when it asked for 20,000. And the second one pulled about 185,000 when I asked for 20,000. And back then on Kickstarter, my favorite thing, um, the report this project button was very close, they've redesigned since, was very close to the ask the project creator a question button. <laughs> so every once in a while, I'd get a really difficult to understand PM. I was like, oh, you're trying to report me. Got it, got it. <laughs> it's like, one of them was something like, what is the point of telling you about this disgusting trash if you don't do anything about it. And I was sitting there like, <laughs> oh, oh, you fucked up. <laughs> and quite frankly, it's like, I'm really glad I have the husband I do because, you know, the real Spike would have sent a reply. <laughs> but my husband, he does this thing, he'll stand next to me and he'll just go, Baby. <laughs> Baby. You know what? If you still want to do it tomorrow, I'll let you. But right now, baby. <laughs> so it didn't happen. But um, Smut Peddler 2014, when I was making it, you can see on there, its subtitle is Lady Porn Conquers Earth. And <laughs> when I was making that title, I was like, well, that's a little self-important. I was like, oh, it's marketing, it's marketing. I'll just, you know, I'll, Lady Porn Conquers Earth. It was the most popular project on Kickstarter for about two days. It was fully funded in two hours, so it hit $20,000 in two hours. It was beating out 3D printers. It was beating out dress up like a Tyrannosaurus cardboard kits. It was beating everything. And it's like I had fantasies of dynamite on the cover, just, you know, fucking taking down Tokyo with her, her feather bow. I was like, yeah, that's right. You like it, don't you? <laughs> Um, this sort of started a lot. It started a big thing on Kickstarter where I think a lot of people finally saw the market for this kind of material and the potential of Kickstarter in general because this pretty much opened up the floodgates. A little about me, I'm really into the idea of artists getting paid and you'd think that's you know, basic shit, right? You'd think that's basic shit. Like, of course, artists get paid their skilled professionals. <laughs> oh. um, work into every Kickstarter that I do that is sort of an anthology project with multiple creators 
is a thing where all the extra money that is made after everything is paid for, it gets divided up among the creators. And there are people who walked away, walked away from Smut Peddler 2014, drawing 20 pages of comics for an independent comic book company run by one person with $3,000 in pay for 20 pages of comics. And that is a point of pride. I still smile when I think about stuff like that. And, you know, the Smut Peddler isn't all I do. I do a lot of stuff. The, you know, my first webcomic, Templar, Arizona, that I was doing in the bad old days there when, you know, comics on the internet weren't any good and no one liked them. That is what sort of stabilized me. That is what gave me confidence. And, yeah, I, you know what? This is working out. I can do this. And Poor Craft is up there. It's, um, you know, it was my first Kickstarter project. It was super important to me. And it kind of proved the, the veracity of the model. And ever since then, I've been kind of keeping to my general, my general approach in publishing, which is, you know, Smut Peddler is in line with that approach, which is I want to put things out there that I don't see. I want to put things out there that people tell me no one wants. And I'm going to prove them wrong. And I'm going to establish myself doing it. And I'm going to make a point. So I published The Sleep of Reason with a cover by Michael DeForge. If it looks kind of familiar, he does some work on Adventure Time. And it's a horror anthology because I wanted to see horror that wasn't like action adventure starring an established Hollywood creature. You know, like everyone knows the Wolfman and the alien and the this and the that. And those aren't scary. I know everything there is to know about what to do if a vampire comes after me. <laughs> like, we all, I mean, who's like, oh, werewolf, right. Silver bullet, yeah, I know all that. Oh, zombie, sure, okay, yeah, shoot him in the head, no problem. What's so scary about knowing exactly how to handle something? <laughs> so when I made The Sleep of Reason, it was specifically about just sort of helplessness and dread and being unable to save yourself and just not understanding what's going on, which quite frankly is terrifying to me. And the emails I get back about it are like, I couldn't finish it. And I'm all like, good. <laughs> I'm really, really proud of that one. And Poor Craft, when it, obviously it did really well, so I had to do a, a sequel, you know? And I worked with a cartoonist named Ryan Estrada, who I've lost track of all the places he's lived. He lived in India, he's lived in South Korea, he's lived in Japan, he's lived in Mexico, he's lived all over the world, he can't seem to sit still. And he's a cartoonist, so he has no money. So no one kind of understands how he does this. And Ryan, I, I have to give him a shout out, he's an amazing individual. Um, I wrote him and I was like, hey, I'm making a sequel to Porecraft, and it's gonna be about travel, it's gonna be called Porecraft Wish You Were Here, are you interested? And he went, yes, here are the first 10 pages. <laughs> and I was like, um, Ryan, that is great. That's good. I'm really happy for you. But let's put the contract together first. Because <laughs> I want this to be completely above board and, you know, like just really professional. And he's like, great idea. Here's the rest of it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, you know, that's the kind of people I love to work with. Like, Ryan is definitely, he's one of sort of like the internet crowd, like me. It's like he's one of those guys who the mainstream publishing world was so ready to write us all off. And he was just amazing to work with. And the book turned out incredible. And I'm probably going to be using it myself sometime in the future. And after Poor Craft and Sleep of Reason and all my Temple Arizona books, the two books I kickstarted this year were New World, which is a sci-fi fantasy anthology. And the approach to that was like, you know what I always see? I always see action, adventure, fantasy, and sci-fi, which are about conquest, and they're about dungeon raids, and they're about adventure. But um, from my perspective, personally, your adventure is taking place in someone else's house. And when you show up and kill a bunch of people and snatch the treasure and go home triumphant, there's someone who lived there who's coming home who's all like, you literally kicked my door down and killed my family. And it just struck me as, like, it's, it's not right. The right stories aren't being told. There are stories of triumph and destruction and let's go on an adventure, but that adventure is somebody else's disaster. And we don't hear anything from the people who live in the exotic locale that you've decided to ride your flying dirigible to in your pith helmet with your gear-studded pistol and, and shoot like 20 random brown people. 
It's like each of those 20 random brown people is going about their business and all of a sudden you are here to snatch their golden idol. And we're very used to that perspective, the perspective of the, the grand, quite frankly, usually white adventurer. And I, I was fucking sick of it. So that's kind of what New World is about. It's about culture clash on equal terms. It's about your adventure being someone else's disaster. <laughs> Coming out soon. <laughs> and uh, the last one was a book, if I'm not mistaken, turned down by a lot of other publishers. Another webcomic, surprise, surprise, called The Less Than Epic Adventures of TJ and Amal. <gasps> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> It's by an amazing cartoonist named E.K. Weaver who's been working on it for years, and she's one of those super infuriating people that like, got into comics two minutes ago and produces like, master quality work that just makes you like, take everything on your table like, well, <laughs> no point anymore. And it's a love story. And one of the things that struck me about it is comics is a real confederated sort of, sort of business, and it was being characterized in a lot of circles as yaoi. When, which is basically man and man, a man falling in love with a man, but it was, I was super not into that kind of compartmentalization because people assume the instant they hear that word that, oh, I know exactly what this is. And like, no, actually you don't. And the storytelling is so well done and it's a believable, amazing love story. And people were just like, nope, not here. So I was like, I'll take it on. Which is, again, my career, again, it's like everything, everything you see here on this, on this screen sort of entered the world to a course of that will never work. But Smut Peddler is still probably, it's, it's, it's a watershed moment for me because that was when I stopped listening to that will never work. That's when it stopped sort of needling me and that's when sort of my subconscious fears that I was about to crash and burn spectacularly finally alleviated. Because, you know, obviously you're not in comics unless you love comics because there is no money in this. Despite everything you have just heard, no, we're all poor. But <laughs> it's like we live in a capitalist society, yeah? And a lot of sort of validation of whether something is good or bad relies on how much money it makes. And I grew up in that society, sorry. And when 5,000 people tell me, actually, yes, apparently that's my tipping point. That's when I start believing it, when something is good. And the people I know for a fact don't want me there. Suddenly, their voices become that much fainter. And suddenly, I'm not lying in bed at night thinking to myself, Fuck, what if, no, what if this isn't working? What if this isn't a good idea? What if I'm completely wrong about everything? And Smut Peddler did that for me. Iron Circus was founded in 2007. Um, its original intent was just to publish things I made, but going back to the whole, I didn't plan to be here thing, now I run the biggest comic book publisher in Chicago. And now I'm getting emails and interviews and things of people I'm, I didn't even know they knew I was alive. And I'm getting people lining up trying to work with me. And it's, it's an amazing place to be and I'm just sort of, I'd almost wanna say grateful but that doesn't feel right because I fought for this. And I fought for this against people that were, they were invested in my failure. I almost don't wanna like focus on it but there is a general din in sort of pop culture right now, maybe some of you are familiar with it, that there is a certain group of people that feel their TV and movies and video games and comics are under threat by people that are not like them. And these people that are not like them want to take what is theirs and change it and make it worse. Um, I got, just real quick, there have always been black people and brown people and women and queers and trans folk in comics, in movies, in sci-fi, in fantasy, and in television. We have always been here. And, <laughs> yeah.
We are not taking anything from you because it was never yours to begin with. And we were always welcome as consumers as long as we didn't ask for representation. And now that there are more people demanding to be heard and demanding to be included on the creative side, suddenly you have a problem. But the thing that a lot of these folks don't understand is this is not a fight. It's over. We're, we're here. We're not going anywhere. We have always been here. And now we are part of the production process. And if you have a problem with that, I don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, Mr. You know, education and background, I'm, I'm not fooling myself. I know there are people like that in positions of power. And I know that they're not consciously interested in making sure I'm not heard, but maybe on some level, they justify it to themselves with, well, the world's not ready. You know, the Obama line, the world's not really ready. Maybe in a few years, not now, the world's not ready. But Kickstarter means I don't have to go through these people. It means I can basically invent a means of financing and creating the books that I want to make, and clearly lots of other people want to read. And that is what scares them. And when I look back right now, I sort of try to put it in a place. I, I, I try to compartmentalize it in a non-personal kind of thing. It's not a specific fear and hatred of me and what I'm doing. It's a fear and hatred of something inexorable that they can't stop. It's a fear and hatred of change itself. They're comfortable. Comics is so comfortable. It, it wants to write superhero stories, and it wants to sell them in comic book shops, and it wants to maybe every once in a while make a movie about men in tights. And that's what comic wants, but that is not what comics is, and that is not what comics will be in the future. And going to Kickstarter and pre-ordering every book I do on there, mailing those out, then getting them in shops as an afterthought, I can't, I've lost count of the times I've been told how unprofessional that is. And again, I've learned to stop listening because the goalposts for unprofessional will always move to disqualify you if somebody doesn't want you there. And, <laughs> and quite frankly, the tenor of criticism has changed from that will never work to yes, but that doesn't count. And that's kind of them showing their ass. <laughs> Don't waste your time trying to win over people who are determined to see you on the outs or as the loser pretty much no matter what. I know it's like I wasted entirely too much time hoping for a legitimacy that doesn't exist. What I'm going to do from now on is I'm going to make comics and they're going to be fucking amazing and people are going to read them and love them and I'm going to get phone calls from NPR and I'm going to go, Jesus, again? <laughs> And I'm going to run Iron Circus. I'm going to make exactly what I want to make because clearly it's working. And you can sit somewhere on Reddit or some other forum or something awful or on Twitter or on Tumblr and talk yourself into what I'm doing somehow doesn't count. But you are literally verifiably wrong. You are completely on the losing side at this point because I don't have to prove myself to you. What I'm doing works. I know what I'm doing. And what I'm doing is making comics a better place for everyone, not just people like you and not just people like me. I am opening a door and I am making sure everyone knows that what they have to say and what they have to draw, what they have to write and what they want to publish, somebody wants to hear it. And that's really all I fucking care about. <laughs> Thank you. Trotman. Thank <laughs> you.